So I have this really annoying habit where books that I read on ebook, I don't actually give updates on usually in reading vlogs because I usually, I'll read just a little bit before bed in the evening on my Kindle, on my Paperwhite, um, but I'm not actively reading it during my main reading time, so I just don't think about talking about it. All that to say, I read Minute Arms and forgot to tell you that I was reading Minute Arms. So let's talk about it. Usually for the books that I give dedicated reviews for, I will make them spoiler filled and the spoiler free section, I direct you towards the reading vlog, but since there was none, let's do both. We'll have a spoiler free section and then we'll do a spoiler section where I dig into some of my favorite scenes, themes, all that good stuff. And it's funny because this book is not long, but it's so jam packed with discussion points, whether you wanna talk about the brilliance and chaos of the plot, whether you wanna talk about the characters and what they go through in this book, or you wanna dig into the themes that Pratchett is digging into. It's a book that truly I could spend an hour talking about, can't today, but um, could. So let's try. Spoiler free, Men at Arms, the sequel to Guards, Guards. We are continuing on with following The Night Watch. I think this is a year later. Um, so there's been some progress. We have one character that is now more in a leadership role that was not in the first book. We have a character that's getting married that the romance was introduced in the last book. We have a whole bunch of new characters that are amazing. There's new chaos happening. So, so. Some, so, oh, so many things <laughs> happened in this book. The plot here is that there's then there's an assassin's guild um, and there was a theft that happened and not one where they had a license to thieve. So there's organized crime in this book or in this series where you get a, li a license, theft isn't illegal, you get a permit to do your theft. So it's approved, it's organized, it's organized crime. And for this Assassin's Guild, there was a gone stolen. They have a lot of different, um, a lot of different killing <laughs> um, uh, weapons, knives, swords, uh, bow and arrows, lots, lots of great ways to kill. But there's one long range item that they have that they can use that's super handy, um, but it was stolen. It's called a gone, G-O-N-N-E, it's a gun. So it was stolen and uh, not legally. <laughs> there was no permit given. There's also deaths happening, but again, not organized. So the system is not being utilized correctly and the Night Watch is coming in to solve the series of crimes that are going on, the series of murders, as well as trying to get the gone back. And on top of all that, we still have our same thing that was happening in the first book, which is the fact that there are people who want a king and there are certain candidates that are being brought to the forefront to being a potential, a potential king. Uh, there's a lot of expanding on the world that happens in this. Um, particularly one that I loved was the expansion of the guilds. We got to know some of the guilds a little bit better. There's a guild for everything. There's there's organizations and and groups of people <laughs> for like every category. And we got to we got to know a couple other guilds um, in this. My favorite was the, the clowns guild. There was a clown that was murdered. And through that, we get to know the Clowns Guild a little bit more. And so every single guild is a subversion of expectations. And, <laughs> and the subversion of the Clowns Guild is just my favorite thing. But we also have Carrot more in a leadership role and we get to see how he handles that as well as bringing in more members of the watch. So a main key theme in this book is racism uh, through fantasy races. So it would be unfair, I think, for me to say that this concept of exploring racism through fantasy races, through fantasy races, through um, uh, humans and dwarves and elves and trolls and, um, and werewolves and like through that, that this concept is kind of old hat. It's something that you see done. Funny enough, I was reading two books at the same time, Men at Arms and The Goblin Emperor that were doing this very thing. Um, <laughs> it's just it's just a thing that happens. But I do feel that it would be a bit unfair for me to say this is old hat because this is an old book. So for all I know, this wasn't so common when Pratchett wrote this. But I will say that the way Pratchett did it is the way that I 
like this sort of thing done where he doesn't just do it kind of surface level um, discussion, but he really views it from a lot of different angles. And uh, also with his signature sense of humor where he kind of makes fun of a lot of people's positions, a lot of people's mindsets. He essentially is saying, look how stupid this is. Uh, he also spends some time talking about addiction and classism and leadership and hierarchies, monarchies. He really, there's a lot of sub themes that he touches on as well. Uh, this is the the book with the kind of iconic quote that I heard before I ever read any Discworld books and before I even knew that it was a Discworld quote, uh, I saw Neil Gaiman quoting it, the one about the boots. The one where he talks about how a poor man may be able to afford a $10 pair of boots that will only last him six months, whereas a wealthy man could afford a $50 pair of boots that'll last him five years. So the poor man's boots uh, wear out every six months and every six months he has to keep buying another pair of $10 boots and by the end of the five years he's paid twice what the wealthy man paid and the whole time he's still had wet socks. So kind of those, those discussions that just kind of seep into the story uh, that don't take a lot of focus but that are poignant enough and, and impactful enough that they just on their own hold a lot of significance without context. In fact, throughout this entire time reading this book, I would just read quotes to my husband, uh, things that were funny and things that were thoughtful, and he never needed context around the quote and he could just appreciate them, which I think is something really special that Pratchett did. Uh, I'll give you a more funny example of that because this book is loaded with humor. Um, in in this, he was echoing the patrician's view of crime and punishment. If there was a crime, there should be punishment. If the specific criminal should be involved in the punishment process, then this was a happy accident. But if not, then any criminal would do. And since everyone was undoubtedly guilty of something, the net result was that in general terms, justice was done. And I just love his, the way Pratchett plays with words and the way he can take something that's so commonplace to us and twist it into just humor, just satire. But anyway, I really enjoyed this book. It was still loaded with humor. It was loaded with some great discussions. The plot was fun. The new characters that we got introduced were phenomenal. And the personal journeys that are already established characters are going on. I'm so interested in, and I cannot wait to see where else their stories go, particularly Carrot. Can't wait to see where his story goes. I love this book. Now let's talk about some spoilery things. First of all, I wanna talk about Angua because I'm pretty mad at myself for not figuring this out. Um, she, so in the beginning, the the watch has to do some diversity hires. They want to make the watch, or rather, it's being asked that the watch is more diverse. And so because of that, they're like, we need one of each. So let's start hiring people based off of their race. We need a troll, we need a dwarf, we need so on. So what keeps being brought up is that Engwa is brought in because she's a, w and then they keep getting cut off. Now me and my dumb self, I'm like, aha, Pratchett's doing something. He wants me to think that it's because she's a woman. But it actually, it's because she's a witch. Because <laughs> that starts with a W2. And then we get the talking dog that no one can hear but her. And I'm just like, oh, how interesting. And I don't think maybe there's a reason only she can hear it. And it wasn't until the scene at the inn. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Oh, never mind. I didn't write down the quote, dadgummit. It wasn't until she was at the inn and Carrot was dropping her off and he was like, oh, why are you staying here? There's banshees, there's ghosts, there's all these things. And she was, you know, not not super impressed. She's like, it, you know, the, the common theme of racism throughout this and certain races being uh, stigmatized and having, having certain prejudices assigned to them and people having these biases about them. And, um, and she kind of confronts him on that, but then she looks up and sees the moon and has to scurry back inside and not finish their conversation. And I'm such a dummy. That was when I realized, ah, oh, of course, she's staying at this inn with races that are, that people generally don't want to 
uh, converse with, generally don't want to associate with. She has to stay there because it's the end that'll take her. And she can understand this talking dog, of course. Anyway, I do really like Pratchett's exploration of racism in this because you have the people, you have the overt racism, uh, like like dwarves and trolls outright don't like each other. Uh, you have lots of lines like, like when Nobby is talking to Carrot and he says, he's got motive. And Carrot says, yes. Yes, Hammerhawk was a dwarf. That's not a motive. It is for a troll. Anyway, if he didn't do that, he probably did something. There's plenty of evidence against him. Like what, said Angua. He's a troll. That's not evidence. I've got nothing against dwarves, mind you, said the fat man. I mean, dwarves are practically people in my book, just shorter humans, almost. But trolls, well, they're not the same as us, right? So you have people that have this very overt reaction to different races. And then you also have very, um, some unintentional biases, things that people have just grown up hearing and believing and are confronted with, like with Carrot and the way he responds to uh, ghouls and 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 uh, ghosts and banshees in the inn that, uh, that Angua is staying in, where people will just say something and then get confronted about it and then realize, oh, okay, that's something I need to acknowledge and work out. But then you have interesting dynamics of it, like with Carrot, who is a human, but was adopted by and raised as a dwarf. So he, by all intents and purposes, is of dwarven culture. He was raised this way, their customs, their beliefs, their uh, their ways of life are all his. And he commonly introduces himself as a dwarf because that's how he was raised. That's all he knows. Being a human is actually far more foreign to him. Yet he's human passing. And so he has a lot of instances where he just doesn't experience the same racism that dwarves experience because he passes as human. And so people treat him with a different level of respect that would have a bias against dwarves. And sometimes even say stuff about dwarves to Carrot. And he's like, yeah, that's me you're talking about. So there's also that other layer of it. And then on top of that, you have that same other layer of Angua who is passing as human, yet she is technically, well, in all, in all, in all ways, she is a werewolf, but she can and does pass as human because quite frankly, it's possible that her safety would be at risk if she disclosed her actual race to certain people. It's not just this very simple surface level thing. He's really trying to tackle it from a lot of different angles and confront it from a lot of different places, which I thought was really interesting to read. And then with Vimes, who frankly just was not in this book enough, <laughs> but Vimes, you also have his struggle where he's part of the problem as far as, as far as the racism goes, but he also has his own struggle with this new life. He's someone who grew up dirt poor, who had nothing and is an important piece of the watch and now has to give up this important piece of himself that he really identifies with. Like it's a big part of who he is as a person, a member of the watch. And now he has to give this up and he has to have this new life with this new wife who he does love, but who also has this extraordinary amount of privilege. There's lines in here where he talks about wealth that is so strong that you don't have to spend money. You have so much money that you don't have to spend money. So it's this massive, it's this massive shift in life now where he, it's Lady Sybil really wants him to experience the finer things in life, but it's such a huge piece of himself to have been raised the way he was raised. And it's it's this massive, it's like whiplash for him to have fallen in love with this woman who's wonderful, but that has this extremely different life than he does. And it's a, a very minor piece of the book, but it was something that I really, really appreciated uh, the way Pratchett handled it. And then you also have the fact that Vimes relapses. He has this addictive personality and he, in this book, relapses and uh, goes back into alcoholism. And all of this was just handled so delicately and again, from a lot of different angles that it just felt like it wasn't just 
here's something to talk about, but it really felt like Pratchett was handling it with a lot of care and a lot of thought, and that's something that I love about his books, because as loaded with humor as they are, and as loaded with hilarious scenes as they are, when he does want to talk about something, I really love the way he talks about it. Which now, let's talk about some humor, because, because I've kind of been talking a lot about some of the, some of the more thematic things, but there's so much humor loaded into these books. Like when they catch a thief and it says, Colin unhook the cell keys from their nail over the desk and toss them to the thief. All right, cell three, take the keys in with you. We'll holler if we need them back. Like the way they handle, the way they handle justice and law and order in this series is so, it's constantly surprising me. Just in the in the major ways, like the way the guilds, guilds are run and the way you need a permit to thieve or, or the way they handle like, um, there aren't a lot of deaths that happen around here, but there are a lot of suicides. Like someone will just be walking down the road and then bam, suicide and just like crazy. <laughs> it's like, obviously people are getting killed off, but they just choose not to, not to call it that. Or in this instance where the way they handle a criminal that they caught is, is to say, all right, here, just take the keys in with you, we'll let you know if we need them. It's just like, the, it's constantly surprising me and cracking me up. There was the scene when they were, when they were bringing in the new guild members and, uh, and they, <laughs> they, they, Carrot was like, you know, we're supposed to be doing the, the oath, the, the long form oath, uh, that we're supposed to recite. And, and whoever was in charge of it, I don't remember now, maybe it was Nobby, was like, oh yeah, sure. Um, do, do you happen to know it? Kara goes, of course I do, because of course he does. So he recites it all by heart, but because he's such a literal man, because he views the world very simply, not dumbly, just simply, uh, he starts reciting it, but he leaves insert person's name here or uh, insert she, he, whatever, you know, like the, the bracketed text, he just reads off just all at once without any, <laughs> any sort of... Um, acknowledgement of what he's doing and how he's doing it. And then everybody's repeating after him. And because trolls are more of a, a slow thinker and a slow speaker and a slow processor, you've got them moved on, like three steps moved on from this oath and the troll is still reciting it. And it's just like, it's so fun. It's so fun. D Detritus, that's his name. Oh, and G G Gestapo, the dog. <laughs> the talking dog. I love that nobody can hear him talking, but they're affected by what he says. So it's it's that that kind of uh, standard um, idea of mortals or humans um, see something magical, but their brain needs to process it as as non magical in order to keep their sanity and in order to keep their worldview intact and their beliefs intact. So they see and encounter something magical, but then their brains justify it and twist it and change it. Um, that's like how the muggles respond to magic in Harry Potter. It's how uh, a lot of a lot of people respond to things in in stuff like Doctor Who and um, I don't know a bunch a bunch of of series do this. But anyway. That's how it is with Gestapo, where he speaks and nobody really, like something's going on <laughs> and they're receiving it and it's influencing them, but they're not, there's like a barrier in their mind that's refusing to allow this to be true, except for, of course, with Angua. Um, but I love when Gestapo was like, no, dogs don't talk. And the ones that do, that's just a statistical anomaly. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> on about. It's like, I love the most off the wall things that they say to justify or to explain the chaos of this world. And then finally, I've been going on plenty long enough um, and I have to leave soon. I get to drive six hours today. Yay. Um, so I have to leave in a minute. But one last thing that I really want to dig into or not dig into, but mention. One last thing that I, that I wanna mention is I really love in this book that Carrot is someone who is so unassuming and so sweet and, and is just happy to, he's just very content with whatever life gives him. Um, and in this book, he's put in a position of leadership and he's given responsibilities and we get to see on display how good of a leader he is and how good of a king he would be. And he's even given the opportunity to pursue that title, but just isn't interested in it. He He's shown to be someone who could potentially thrive in this role, 
And I love the way Pratchett did it, where he just shows us very organically that he would thrive rather than just saying it. But we really get to see um, how how good he is in a leadership position. And then he's given that opportunity and he's just like, no, nah, I don't want that. Um, we actually do see him pull a sword out of the stone in one of the in one of the the high action scenes. He actually pulls a sword out of the stone. And then whenever he's, when he's at the end of the book, when he's uh, having this conversation, tell me, Captain, what, uh, tell me, Captain, this business about there being an heir to the throne, what do you think about it? This is now Carrot talking. I don't think about it, sir. That's all sorted as stone nonsense. Kings don't come out of nowhere waving a sword and putting everything right. Everyone knows that. That's literally what you just did, Carrot. You literally just pulled a sword out of the stone, waved a sword, and, and you're putting things right. But there was some talk of evidence? No one seems to know where that is, sir. When I spoke to Captain, to Commander Vimes, he said you'd got it then I must have put it down somewhere. I'm sure I couldn't say where, sir. Like, it just, <laughs> Carrot, you literally, like, this is it. This is it for you. And you're just like, nah, sword and stone, sword in the stone stuff. That, that's nonsense, fairy tales. <laughs> it's not real. <laughs> and he's like, you have the, the sword. Nah, I don't have the sword. I don't know what happened to that. Couldn't tell you where it is. Like, it's just, I, I'm so excited to see what Pratchett does with Carrot specific. I'm excited to see what he does with Vimes, with um, Angua, well, like, with, with everybody. But with Carrot specifically, I'm excited to see what Pratchett does with, obviously, with the desk. And, and in book one, I don't think I talked about this in, in the review for book one, but there were already plenty of clues, like, with his birthmark and things like that, that he was destined to become the king. And then here we go in book two, we're, we're officially confronting it. And he's just showing no interest, which I love. And and it and it super works for the things that, that Pratchett is doing in this series so far. But I just am so excited to see what happens. Does he ever become king? Or does he just continue to not acknowledge it and somebody else takes the role? I don't know. But I, it's wonderful. Um, I guess I should, I, it would be wrong of me to not acknowledge that Cubby does die in this one, which is was very emotional, very... Pratchett does such a good job of kind of bouncing between these chaotic, high action, crazy scenes um, and this humor, but then still making those those emotional moments count. And he's just an author that just continues to impress me. He just, I, I put out a video last week, um, the most, my t top 10 best written series or you know best authors write the best whatever the concept was and Pratchett was on my list because he's just really blown me away with his ability to um to write such depth and humor and to play with words and I just I guess I'm just I'm really impressed with how much he can do so well yeah, I feel like this has been plenty long enough, even though it was a bit all over the place, so I'm sorry about that. Um, let me know what you think as far as continuing on with the Night Watch books. Once I finish this this arc, the Night Watch arc, uh, oh, yeah, that's what it's called, I think, um, I will have other booktubers on and we'll talk about this arc as a whole, but as far as me still working through this series, do you like this format? Do you want something a little bit more structured where I go point by point and, and try to like really dig into it a little bit more? I don't know. Let me know what you think. Uh, but I love this book. I will be reading Feet of Clay very soon and I'm having an awesome time reading through the uh, Discworld series. I post videos every Monday and Friday on the main channel, Tuesdays and Thursdays on the second channel. I'll see you again soon. Bye.